Welcome to the final session of our fourth annual uh, spring conference. We do do it in the spring on uh, creativity. And we've had a full afternoon of wonderful talks, and we're going to polish off that achievement with another wonderful talk. And uh, the speaker this evening is Leslie Michael Murray. All right. <laughs> who is writing his <laughs> who is writing his dissertation on an incredibly difficult to explain subject <laughs> at uh, Southern Illinois University Carbondale as a philosophy student, and I say this with actually some pride. The fact that it's not easily explained is a good thing. It's not a bad thing, uh, but a part, and I mean a part, a tiny part of that research, is on the table for this evening. Uh, and it's a creative dissertation on a creative subject, something nobody has really explored in just this way before. But isn't that, after all, the point of a doctoral dissertation? And so, um, without uh, any further delay, I'm going to turn it over to Les Murray to talk about normativity, belonging, and stability, and a lot of the axes that feed into this creatively. Go ahead, Les. <clears throat> yeah! Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I, I really want to give my thanks to uh, Dr. Randall Oksher, who is, uh, him and Rand Randy and Gay have, uh, have uh, been a, a really helpful uh, um, addition to my life, and that definitely good friends, and uh, it's uh, it's good to see your community grow, you know, as uh, as the world goes on. And then uh, also my son here, uh, thank you for coming. And uh, Dr. Shelley Rollins, thank you for showing up as well. And all the other distinguished uh, people who have uh, been presenting here today, thank you for your wonderful presentations. And I hope that I can come close to living up to what you've uh, laid out before. <laughs> so. Uh, Anyway, uh, so the title of my paper right now is a, a piece of my dissertation uh, called For the Time Being, Creative Normativity and Placemaking. Um, I would say by no means like starting off is this work exhaustive. There's a lot of research to be done and I think I'm opening up the door through the lens of creativity um, to kind of get this portion of it really nailed down. So, um, how do human beings create structures in the world? Uh, how do we create, right? One way to look at this uh, creativity is through the lens of normativity, stability, and belonging. Normativity sets the rules or standards to which humans will adhere. We all kind of know this. We study normativity, right? Uh, these vary by culture and epoch, and they are embodied, situated, and embedded within our culture. Uh, we seek stability amidst continually changing landscapes and time spans. We also seek a feeling of belonging within the groups we inhabit, and even a sense of belonging unto ourselves. The creative nature of our real lives require constant innovation, and hence here in this conference, creativity, right? Uh, with an understanding of these shifting grounds, we can make plans to go beyond merely maintaining outmoded rules, preserving temporary individual and social stability, and replacing ourselves for the time being at the limits of stability to create a sense of belonging. We can change our actions to anticipate new orders of normativity. We can create wider platforms that provide stability for the time being and enable communal networks of inclusion <clears throat> open to accepting the widest range of individuals and communities into global, a global temporal process. Uh, and here I try to use Bruno Latour's actor network theory to provide a place to start making sense of these networks of interaction on our evolving planet. Um, so my first section, um, I explain this is a paper I will discuss the role of creativity in forming a normative framework and explain how such frameworks relate to placemaking. In short, an explication of how we create. Uh, Latour's actor network theory is important to touch on as I start here, right? And it's an attempt to explicate a holistic narrative as an explanation of situatedness. Actor network theory, or ANT, 
is radically empirical in its mission to explain the world through what I call explicative or implicative narrative, which is language that I can work on, right? <laughs> um, and such a narrative includes as much about our numerous relations as possible alongside particular subjects op and objects of experience. The relations are just as real as any traditional actant. Um, and James says, the only thing that shall be debatable for radical empiricism um, among philosophers shall be things definable in terms from experience. Things of an unexperienceable nature may exist, but they form no part of the material for philosophical debate. Um, thus, radical empiricism asserts that nothing shall be admitted as a fact except what can be experienced at some definite time by some actant for uh, every feature in, of every fact ever so experienced, a definite place must be found somewhere in the final system of reality. So in other words, everything real must be experienceable somewhere, every kind of thing experienced must be somewhere, must somewhere be real. <clears throat> so it gets to the heart of what it means to be radically empirical. It also expands on what it means to make a place uh, to be experienceable somewhere or to be somewhere real, right? By locating an experience and situating it within a larger context of processes, a living network, um, actor network theory makes these claims. So uh, it's like Deleuze's and Guattari's rhizome theory of relations. Ant strives to overcome our habit of extracting a limited number of subjectively relevant facets of a person, thing, or place. We learn how the relational interactions in the world impart themselves to others through the essential relationships we share. Ant is really a disposition for viewing experience. And thus, we may use Ant to start addressing serious meaningful questions across disciplines as we learn how these connections bear on one another. Um, now, as we start talking about Ant, we need some explicatory language or framework to speak about Ant to make it truly inter interdisciplinary. Uh, Ant seeks to create a novel explicatory language which will emerge from our capacity to manage massive and dense data sets, um, right? Because this is looking at a large set of relations, right? Um, more work is needed to discern exactly how this language will emerge, uh, but Latour starts this work in reassembling the social and introduction to action ne actor network theory and an inquiry into the modes of existence and anthropology of the moderns. Uh, indeed, Latour's work um, and many conversations among colleagues make me aware that my own philosophical language is in need of some revision, and I intend to apply this re these revisions to a larger network across disciplines. So, um, Ant refers to each situation as a network composed of actants and connections or relations. All actants are presupposed to be equally important. Uh, actants are valued by how uh, they interact in the system. And intermediaries are, uh, is a term that is used, They're, these are actants that tend not to change the system, while mediators are actants that do cause change. And so for the theorist, it is possible to have the careful narrative order of the social sciences and the universal descriptive power of a philosophy of science at the same time. And all this without leaving behind the humanities, and indeed, we need not sacrifice the personal in name of what is scientific. So, granting to the, the imperative to succeed in creative efforts weighs on us constantly such that creativity is not wholly free. And we must be directed to the most pressing problems, perhaps in this imperative sense uh, that we are, and it is in this imperative sense that we are in a way condemned to create. For example, it's not too much to say that there is currently an ecological gun to our heads. Our ability to create may determine our ability to survive as a species. Uh, creativity surprisingly becomes an imperative to make something work with the tools, skills, and ideas that we have at our disposal. In philosophical discourse, this means we must employ the works of those who came before us, as well as numerous techniques at our disposal to create a holistic view of experience. As we develop these new ideas, it is worth pausing to ask ourselves, 
How do we identify if something is truly creative? We do this because we describe something as being creative, innovative, or novel through a comparison. This comparison, of course, is qualitative. Uh, primarily, the comparison we make occurs when we recognize the novelty of such efforts uh, because it is not like anything we've ever seen before, right? So then we know it's novel. Um, we have no good method for, of, for a comparison of this, of this sort except for this qualitative criteria. And so the creative work is new and the modes of creativity are, new, are numerous. <clears throat> um, we do have our memory and libraries to draw resources from, filled with sources to interpret, um, but creativity seems to occur from the intellect expressed by combining our knowledge with lived experience and these expressions emerge in experience. So there are more ways to be creative than there are uh, ways to do art, for example. Uh, and for that matter, um, what type of art is meant in any instance? So when we talk about creativity related to art, this is a, a problem that we you know, need to address. So, uh, so however, when we have a problem or a crisis, we must recognize the difference between what is either outmoded or obsolete and what is creative in a way that succeeds in solving the problem at hand or else we fail. And such failure can be the difference between life and death. So uh, normativity is a broad and general term that I use to attempt to describe how to designate actions that are desired, good, or at least permissible. permissible. Normativity also marks other acts as being undesirable, bad, or impermissible. Does anyone dare say deplorable? Uh, norms provide standards, practice, and rules for evaluating and making judgments that we can employ to govern being. And thus, Ant locates normativity as an actant within the network that mediates. Uh, normativity is a response to, a question, to questions of value. And from this responsive standpoint, we can create new normative frames. Let us examine some familiar characteristics of any normative process. First, normativity is, embodied, is an embodied frame of reference, which is usually codified by some set of rules or laws, even if these are unwritten. Second, normativity frames are experienced from a situated standpoint which allows an individual or group to interpret the meaning of established norms through a familiar lens. Such situated familiarity makes it possible for a set of standards to be recognized within a network of interactions which is recognizable, recognizable to all actants to which such norms are applicable. Third, these normative phrases are embedded within their networks in such a way that it is difficult for actants within a normative frame to conceive of any new standard that conflicts with the present, present normative frames they exist within, right? And uh, <clears throat> like fish and water, the idea of a world without water is foreign. Water is the milieu of being for a fish, but both are actants. Uh, leaving the milieu is unimaginable and such a departure is synonymous with death for the fish. Nevertheless, failure to adapt to the milieu is no better, right? They need to be able to work in the water. Thus, we need to become both interpreter and translator to create new normativity. So pressing forward, Ant helps us to recognize that this is the failure of current norms, standards, or practices that press us to consider implementing changes in current standards and practices. So there's a failure at, at play when we think about changing our norms. Uh, most people will not change until they must. Even then, there will be a strong resistance to such change. Such reliance on failure occurring may not be the best way to determine whether any system or device is outmoded. We need not wait so long in every case. This is especially true when people habituate themselves to standards and practices. Some normative frames seem to work very well for those who are habituated to them, even though they create stumbling blocks for those whom the norms are not well suited. Uh, sometimes these obstacles are insurmountable. They simply cannot make the change. For those who thrive within a normative network, they create for themselves lasting stability and belonging. 
uh, one can understand their interest in maintaining the paradigm. And ant helps us to mark out such normative frames and give us modes to change them. <clears throat> we can begin to exam examine our normative frames by looking through the lens of ant. Normativity is not just a framework, but is also an experience of being that is embodied, situated, and embedded within our concepts of normativity, stability, and belonging. This creative approach can generate or innovate the outcomes we seek while also providing information about the approaches that resist or fail to achieve the desired outcomes we seek. It is one method among many. By investigating the forms of, norm of a normative framework or a network using ANT, we can discover obvious distortions and changes related to the networks of interactions. So it's sometimes it's the interactions themselves that, that reveal and so, um, and after all, that's because change is what we notice. Uh, from such investigations, new methods emerge to br bridge the distance between the existing methods and alternate narrative methods that ANT has to offer. Ideally, we may employ ANT to guide our judgments within various fields of inquiry. When we fail, we may shift the field of inquiry to be adapted to a new method or shift the method to adapt to numerous fields of inquiry. As we begin the process of explicating the ant process of creating normativity, I will speak briefly about process as I see it. Heraclitus is the first pre-Socratic philosopher to introduce the notion of process at the heart of existence as he sees it. Uh, he says you can never put your foot in the same river twice, uh, meaning that the whole of existence flows like a river and is constantly in flux regardless of our illusory perception of stability. The flowing stream is a great example. William James uses this stream metaphor in the stream of consciousness. Um, perhaps it's not always clear that the substance is never the same. The water you see is gone in seconds in a stream, right? But the ever-changing nature of the ripples and the patterns are abstractions from the flowing movement that appear and vanish in this process. Ant takes the notion of process as a given. All that we called being is change and flux. Being is the process of becoming and the things within being, objects, events, entities, conditions, structures, etc., are the forms that our abstractions of such a process present. Thus, while being is always in motion and creating itself, we participate by creating abstractions from our per perceptions of the process. Each act in a network is included in the process and is equally relevant. Sticking with process for a more recent view of process of being and the importance of creativity, Alfred North White, Whitehead presents helpful insights. His influence on Latour and Ant are significant. Uh, he says, the process of, cre process of creation is the form of unity of the universe. For Whitehead, the movement of each occasion, each potentiality to its own actualization is the basis of creativity. This is how whatever might be becomes the actual world. He says there is a feeling beyond which is to be determined, uh, rooted in the immediacy of the present occasion where each occasion feels itself. Thus, each occasion is situated on the edge of a present moment in the process of being. Um, maybe even the penumbra, right? like some kind of an eclipse thing, right? So uh, for Whitehead, life is a passage from physical order to pure mental originality. Uh, the process of being can be seen as a creative act that we all participate in as reality unfolds and becomes canalized in the actual world. Therefore, Whitehead reveals how creativity is embodied in experience, situated within an occasion, and embedded with all its potentiality in the fabric of existence and creativity is the basic function of being. The ant process seeks to provide an explication of creative, creative acts of being. I will employ an example of the bricolure and bricolage to show how we create normative structures and engage in placemaking. Uh, throughout Latour's work, he draws on Claude Levi-Strauss's terms, bricolure and bricolage, to explicate points about how we create normative frameworks for living. For this work, we should think of 
a bricolage as a construction or a creation from a diverse range <clears throat> of available things that are ready at hand. Uh, this could be any number of things, right? One might imagine an ancient brick mason crew fitting thousands of misshapen stones together somehow to construct a straight and solid wall that will last a thousand years. Surprisingly, many of these complex stone, stone structures use no mortar. In simple words, this is the art of making something work for the time being or making do with what you have. The bricolore is one who engages in the art of bricolage or wields creativity as the situation warrants and makes it work. Uh, the bricolore is thought of as someone like a handyman or a jack of all trades, but when it comes to creativity, the bricolore is an exemplar. So, to address the agency of the bricolore as an actant, I will look at the philosopher as a bricolore. <clears throat> if the philosopher is a bricolore, what do they bring to bear as an agent of change? What is a bricolore? Early definitions reference one who putters about. The puttering about is presumably making oneself busy, tinkering, or doing odd jobs. Uh, Levy Strauss refers to this bricolore as the handyman or the jack of all trades, as I said before. The mythic consciousness of Levi Strauss's savage is a bricolage. And this is the myth mythic consciousness that we work with and everything from the stars to you know, ideas of creation through a monotheistic deity. Um, such a bricolage, bricolage is a product of a lifetime embodied, situated and embedded within a normative network of normativity based on myth. Uh, the created mythological framework provides a sense of normativity, stability, and belonging in experience. Such experience might not make sense to the layperson or the professional who has researched and refined a method with specific tools and materials suited for particular purposes. However, the bricolore is not necessarily an engineer. Even if the bricolore is schooled in such a way, he is still that engineer who can make do with the tools and materials at hand to assemble the bricolage that suits the needs for the time being. This bricolage uses new iterations of bricolage and must constantly form them to fix the problems that arise within the existing frame of reference and create new normativity. Uh, the bricolage begins a project by examining the materials that are available to use. It is often the case that these projects are in media res or in the middle of, right? It's hard to imagine any part of experience that is not in the middle in some way. Uh, the trained engineer approaches a project with an ideal to seek the best of all possible solutions, but is often li limited by some obstacle. The bricolore looks with an interpret eye, uh, interpretive eye at all things immediately available, local and on the ground. The bricolore brings the project to the materials and asks the materials what they can do. They are actants, after all. Uh, opening a dialogue with supposedly inner stuff. The work is improvised, responsive, and often spontaneous as available materials reveal themselves to the practice eye of the workmen, the various qualities of their substance, and the potential for use make them equally meaningful actants for the ant theory. Uh, ant asks us to see the materials as equivalent beings. The materials are actants and are just as important as the other actants who are using them. One example, where would you be without it, right? Right. The bricolore sees the interaction within the networks of our relations, and he understands that the task at hand can be accomplished using numerous techniques and can employ, and employ multiple networks of interactions. And these networks are systems or relations that need to be open, fluid, and creative. The normative network frame represents a way of bringing questions from the theoretical to the practical world of action. Normativity is always created by a network. The bricolore embodies a process of creating connections and forging passages between domains and creating domains, placemaking, where norms can emerge through the work of innovation. By relating the present moment to the networks that have been different before, this moment of need. Thus, the bricolore is situated to act both as a translator and interpreter within a network of actants by taking knowledge of both what was and what is 
a bricolage becomes an embedded construct of what might be, or what eventually will be. The bricolore can make something work for the time being. Ant encourages the bricolore to draw on creativity using available tools and materials within the network to create something specific to the problem at hand. Let's see where this view might be valuable. The normative network of the bricolore seems to be one of crisis management, yet the bricolore must also be conscious of the impermanence of being caught up in an unfolding process of being. Ant views each standpoint within a process as uniquely spatiotemporal, unique event. Hence, the bricolore employs makeshift patches, temporary fixes, and all manner of rigging things up until a better, more permanent solution presents itself. For example, Thank you. The, br the bricolore uses chewing gum to fix a leaky boat. They employ a wire coat hanger to hold up a broken muffler or configure a mixture of wire and bungee cords and straps to stabilize an outdoor umbrella against strong wind. The innovation of the bricolores continue until better methods emerge and become norms. As an actant, the bricolore recognizes complex interconnectivity and its multi-directional nature. There is no absolute starting point for a project except for the one chosen by the actant. In Randall Oxier's work, Time, Will, and Purpose, Living Ideas from the Philosophy of Josiah Royce, he says, the prediction or the future is experienced as an ideal and unactualized, unactualized possibility with some measure of determinate structure and that structure is experienced as a working solution to a problem an individual intends to solve. Thus, when there are no established norms that will always fit each situation, one must ad lib. Such ad libbing is necessary because the, invid the individual finds themselves already participating in an existing world. Thrown into the middle of it, right? Uh, i.e., there's an existing network of relations already in place. For example, it's hard to imagine anyone driving a nail without per first possessing a hammer. Hammering a nail is the accepted method for driving a nail. It's canalized. The hammer and the nail represent a commonplace set of, of relations. However, the bricolore might employ the flat side of a crescent wrench as a hammer to achieve the same goal. Thus, the ant bricolore performs creative acts within order structures and makes new techniques that fit specific networks. The ant sense of creativity, the philosopher as bricolore, uses philosophy as a tool for whatever we need it to do. Philosophy has all manner of tools in its box, phenomenology, hermeneutics, genealogical study, anthropological study, ethics, epistemology, logic, metaphysics, etc., etc. This list is not exhaustive by any means, but we may employ any single method or combinations of methods in order to get at the problem we seek to solve. All entities possess the, creative, the creativity to employ what is at hand in each situation, even if the situation is one as simple as driving a nail or as complex as making a place. This philosophical bricolore need not be the master of every method, but must be familiar enough with general methods in order to be prepared to dive into the work and solve the problems for the time being. Then they count on the existing network of their community to build on their work and refine a method and create a new normative network for location, locating solutions. Placemaking has to do with the distinction between proportion and quality of endurance. The kind of qualities we seek when making a place fall under the guidelines of normativity, stability, and belonging. Determining the proportion and the quality of endurance is something like building your dream home. The quality of intensity is different, but the level of quantity is not. Proportionality is not just how long or how much, and it's not just reckoned in clock time. The most important decisions, proportionally, right, are often temporary things like nurseries in your, for your child, right? This year's garden or choosing a roof for your home. Uh, placemaking is an ongoing creative act where the simple act of driving a nail is the creation of a place both for the nail as a fastening material and a place in time, the act 
of hammering that nail retains in the network of relations. Placemaking as a temporal creative act is cashed out as qualitative proportionality. Some things are for the time being, which might mean just for today. Some are for a lifetime. A place can be made while living in your vehicle or by building a new house. A place can be something as simple as a set of relations that are not confined to spatial location, i.e. a network or an IDF, right? We construct with steel and stone instead of wood when we seek long-lasting structure, but we are never in a quarter when there are no options uh, to step back and evaluate a problem in terms of method and materials we have on hand as the bricolores. The creative act flows from the networks we inhabit, and they are only canalized when we look at them as in the lens of history and view them as if they are no longer unique acts. We can see an example of the canalized treatment of history in, in this way by reviewing an event like the situation in Apollo 13. The situation for the crew was life or death. They were focused on a means at hand rather than creating the means, right? They needed to refine a method of inquiry to solve a problem. The means at hand were not just spare parts, but they were actants. The means are the outcomes of the methodological thinking combined with creativity. The way that the problematic situation is seen is part of the problem itself, right? That's part of the network. So our relation and even our interpretation of a problem are meaningful. Apollo 13 engineers on the ground had to create a means to scrub the air in the space capsule with the parts on hand and ad lib from their canalized methods and create something altogether new to save the lives of that crew. The canalized standpoint of this historical event is viewed as if it could not have been otherwise. Using ant, we can see how there are millions of ways this could have gone right, otherwise, or wrong. As it happened, only the one potentiality of became the actuality that we know as the real event. They had an imperative in their situation to create using the tools and materials they had on hand, even if they were not ideal. Their success was a matter of historical innovation and their creative acts were necessary for themselves for the time being. Got here. Still doing good on time and good. Okay. Temporal necessity is an imperative of creativity and placemaking. The influence of Ralph Waldo Emerson, I call upon here, uh, on the work of figures from Nietzsche to Latour is important when it comes to our own role in the creative act. Emerson says, the key to every man is his thought, and every ultimate fact is only the first of a new series. Every thought will be outthought, every act will be outdone, and every circle will be engulfed within a newer, more encompassing circle. Every idea is a generalization, but it can always be outdone by a more complete generalization, which itself will be incorporated into yet another more complete generalization. The question becomes this, why bother trying to come up with new thoughts at all, since they will all become old and outgrown? His answer is much like Aristotle's, because this is what makes us the best we can be as humans. Uh, a person's thoughts are what make them the most excellent in their attempt to raise themselves above. In fact, he, he boldly says that men cease to interest us when we find their limitations. Emerson is saying that if we stand still, we will be labeled and we are allowing ourselves to be limited. Thus, if we do not find a be creative, to find a way to be creative, to be a brick of lore, we are constraining our growth. When it comes to our growth in thought, Emerson writes, neighbor, nature abhors, uh, abhors the old, and old age seems only as a disease. This old age ought not creep up on the human mind. In nature, every moment is new. Thus, I can orient myself so that the, the negation enables me to project a, onto my next version of myself such that the intensity of each act adds to bringing forward a new normative network. Can you be what you cannot imagine? 
when you do imagine it, you change the calculation. Applying ant accounts for the necessity of changing our calculation because every moment is novelty. Perhaps creating and employing new methods or even appropriating existing methods to unfamiliar sets of problems. The act moves from potential to actual in the creative moment as we draw on existing frames of reference to create new ones. We may not have the traditional tools for the job, however, we must address the problem at hand the best we can with the tools and materials at our disposal, and this is the heart of ANT in its relation to creative action. The ability to imagine the future to conform with the real world makes an intensification, this intensification, right now. In terms of the ant, and the cat, and the cat, and this one, uh, this is the action of a bricolore. A projection can seem so likely sometimes that it can't be true, but many times it must be true. It's an imperative. Our belief in stability is the belief that we can set something in place in perpetuity. Once in place, certain stable norms will lead to a feeling of belonging that lasts a lifetime. For example, being a Saluki alumni is being in a class of people who are more likely to make more money than not. This is just one example of an assumption of stability and belonging that is thought of as an example of how a place is more than just a location of somewhere, right? Being part of a group like a Saluki alumni makes you part of a different sort of place. We believe that the normative frames will carry stability and belonging of a certain kind along with them. The network of relation constitutes a place. The ant practitioner retains this Emersonian view that I am only an experimenter. I do not set the least value on what I do or the least discredit on what I do not. As if I pretend to settle anything as true and false, I unsettle all things. No facts are to me sacred, none are profane. I simply experiment an endless seeker with no past at my back. Such a disposition is designed to help a person see how the past may inform the present mo moment, but no view of the past has priority. No normative frame is sacred. No set of methods are the only method, and no person should allow their situated place in experience to prevent them from finding a new way of being if necessity requires it. We must see the networks we are part of while understanding that we are the bricolores of our own experience. We are part of an existing framework while we create our own bricolage. And so in this part here, I want to go into a little story about my own experience. Um, my first experience of a true bricolore occurred when I was 11. I just moved with my grandparents. We left our home in Ohio and moved to rural North Florida. My grandfather and I set out to build a shed. Um, and of course, this was not quite like a bucky dome, but it was a, a, an octagonal uh, shaped building that was meant to house our water pump and well. And so we gathered the materials. We had a kit with, uh, with instructions and we sketched out our site, right? Um, I was very excited. My excitement dissipated when my grandpa asked me if I had figured it out yet. I did not. I told him I needed some time to look at the plans. He said, okay. He walked away. I felt a rush of excitement and I just devoured the plans, you know, made sure that I did my very best to try to memorize everything that was going on. I thought, maybe I'm going to be the foreman on this job at 11, my <laughs> first job, right? I wasn't sure what was going to happen, but I knew I was going to say those plans as if I were going to be in charge. I needed to focus intently on memorizing the plans and being prepared for action when he returned. And after about 30 minutes, he finally did return. And when he returned, he said, are you ready? Do you have it all figured out? I replied affirmatively, I do. He said, okay, let's see. He scooped up the plans to the structure, 
and started to leave, saying, I'll be back to check on you in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> then he proceeded to walk away with the plans to the structure and return to the house. I quickly realized that this was a challenge of so some sort of test of my abilities, or even a test of my word, that I did, in fact, have it figured out. <laughs> Uh, I did not want to disappoint my grandfather, so I accepted the challenge and resolved myself to pass the test. I remembered the angles that I needed to cut. The angle was 22 and a half degrees. But were there others? I wasn't sure. What tools did I need? I knew I needed a saw and a hammer would be necessary, but I was having difficulty remembering all the tools that I needed because it was an ex extensive list. And uh, I thought I needed a socket too, but what was the size? Uh, so I surveyed the materials I had, and I took some of them with me to the, to the tool shed, and I decided to load up various things in a wheelbarrow, go there and make my assessment, right? And so how, how was I going to make this work? So in short, cut through a, a couple paragraphs here of, of this explanation, because I want to kind of get to the point that uh, with some mistakes, I managed to finish framing up this structure, mostly with the help of the brackets, which were designed to kind of keep you on, in line like training wheels. Uh, <laughs> they, they definitely helped me to figure out things when it wouldn't work. It's like it won't fit here and it's not going there. That doesn't make sense, but it, it gave me a little bit of margin for making mistakes. And, um, and so the experience is not what I would call proper bricolage. But it was one of my first experiences of having to figure out how to do something without having any experience. For me as a young person who wished to impress his grandfather, uh, his demands were immediate and it felt like I was being presented with a crisis along with a responsibility to act in such a way as to solve a problem, uh, which, is, which I find to be the fundamental principle of creativity that embodies the spirit of the bricolore. So in this narrative, I must admit, I was really not the bricolore in this situation. My grandfather was. He was the active mediator and also a bricolore. His lifetimes of experiences guided him in the understanding of the urgency of making a place in the realm of experience. As I mentioned in the beginning, we had just moved to Florida. He needed me to see myself in this place. He recognized that this was not, oh, there's not, that we don't always know what to do but we do things sometimes and figure them out because we must. Creating is an imperative in our own time, no matter how short or long it is. He created a situation where I could embody my own creativity and, get, and engage with the materials. He saw how to build a sense of belonging within me using the tools that he had at hand, which is a shed that we were gonna to build together, right? And helped me learn to listen to the tools and to the materials. And leaving me alone with the plans forced me to trust myself, right? Forced me to be creative, forced me to learn. And his insight was to create a situation to give me a feeling of belonging. Uh, and this feeling emerged both making me feel like I was within a place and also making myself a part of that place. He saw how being part of a place is both being a place unto yourself and being in a place in the world. He facilitated my own network building <laughs> through his creative activity. His efforts were an attempt to show me the importance of creativity in making myself a part of a network of interactions of learning and how to make the best out of my own situations. So. Placemaking is embodied, situated, and embedded in our daily lives. We create normativity as we seek stability and a feeling of belonging. I've highlighted many of the ways that human beings create structure in the, structures in the world. This list is hardly exhaustive. We perform creativity through embodied lived experience, situated in a place of our own making, yet embedded in networks of relations. Each situation is novel. We use the lens of normativity, stability, and belonging to make sense of the world. As I said before, this list is not exhaustive. We create culturally and temporally relevant normativity, which sets the rules or standards for our cultural e epoch. And these vary by culture in epoch, as we can see in the example we find on the news in Ukraine. Right? 
the Russian normativity and For real. it's much different. Um, Help them. So, but we seek stability amidst conti a continually changing landscape and time spans. We also seek a feeling of belonging within the groups we inhabit and even of a sense of belonging unto ourselves. Mm -hmm. The creative nature of our real lives requires constant innovation. We need to be bricklewers, at least in spirit. It shows how we become bricklayers and we create bricolage on the shifting grounds at the limits of stability and replace ourselves for the time being as needed to create a sense of belonging within the networks of interactions in each occasion. Each occasion is unique. We can change our actions to anticipate new orders of normativity. We can create wider platforms that provide stability for the time being and enable communal networks of inclusion to open to accepting the widest range of individuals and communities into this global spatio-temporal process. Using Bruno Latour's actor network theory provides a greater understanding of place through ANT to address the numerous crises we can experience in the contemporary world. That's it. Yeah. Good job. Be right back. <laughs> There's a cat to be tending to. Oh. There's a cat? Yeah. Oh, cat there. So I don't know if there are any uh, questions in the chat, but Julian has a question, so we'll just start with him. Okay. Now, thank you so much, Les, for your talk. That was very, very illuminating. I agree with everything you said, but my question is in um, the German pragmatism um, discourse, how we perceive that, especially in um, the interpretation done by Hans Joas, for example, there is the distinction between, in any action, the realm, so to speak, of justification and of development. Any action has in part of it um, a realm of justification where you, for example, want to a goal, a cer um, attain a certain goal with certain means. So that's, so to speak, the space of utility, but also of normativity and um, preservation of structures. And then you've got this realm that is in this sense real creativity. So the other aspect would not be regarded as actual creativity. But real creativity would been, be then, so to speak, the space of um, development. And that is essentially where you can also find new aims for um, the actions that you're carrying out any day. And my question is, from what you said, would you then say that also normativity is a creative process? That is the first part of what I wanted to ask you. And when you then um, talked about um, your main theorists out in Latour, um, the question comes also up about actants. What can really be an actant? Or to put the question differently, is there anything that cannot be an actant? Because when you're thinking about archaeology, for example, then of course the remainders of ancient cultures, what we find any day, for example, if we just carry a little in the earth, and we right. might find some tools from the past. So I'm not thinking about ancient Egypt, the pyramids, or whatever that is also visible from at large, but we, what we can find um, every day, for example, or be it from our grandfather's generation, you mentioned mm -hmm. your grandfather, mm -hmm. can also such objects become actants? So in what way can anything then basically an actant? That's the second part of the question. Thank you. All right, well, I'll work back um, from the second part of the question just because uh, it's convenient for me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, That's a compelling question. But the, uh, the, can anything be an actant? The answer is yes. Um, and if there's anything that can't be an actant, I think the answer is no. Um, because all actants are participating in experience in some way. So this wine glass is an actant. Now, the ones that make changes are, are separate from the ones that actually don't really have much effect or, or no effect, like the buried artifact once was a, a, a mediating actant, right? That 
that did work with another actant who we would consider to be more of an agent outside of actor, actor network theory, right, using a tool. But the tool itself, much like the cell phone, has a network of interaction attached to it, right? Like the cell phone, for example, uh, employs low-wage workers in China and probably India and has people mining for rare earth metals and resources around the world. Um, whether or not those jobs are good for people or productive is up in the air, right? And then um, there's a whole network of moving this item around the world in tiny little boxes, which makes it super convenient whenever you want a phone. You could probably get one in 24 hours or less, but at the same time, there's a lot of resources being expended because each individual part of this phone is packaged in cardboard and plastic and so forth, which creates more problems. And then there's the, uh, you know, the usage problems. Does it cause cancer? What is it with the screen time and young people? Um, and what effect does that have, right? And uh, <laughs> even the pottery shard has implications of this kind. Exactly. But just not quite as nasty as what well. And the <laughs> well, okay. And so the pottery shard of, of <laughs> if we unearth it, unearth the pottery shard, we don't know what you know. I don't know anything about this pottery shard, but let's assume that it has ancient inscriptions on it, right? And that it's uh, it's something really like makes a movement, changes the whole meaning of you know, a holy scripture or something of that nature, right? It's definitely an actant. And so that part of your question, and then uh, it, I, I think hopefully I answered that sufficiently. And then uh, the first part of your question, justification and development. So I'm not quite sure if I'm ready to answer this question, except for insofar as um, the creative element I think, you know, is more bricolore bricolage than engineer, although the engineer is doing something creative too. It's just been, we've canalized that kind of creativity and, and decided that it was now normative, right? So we've, the normativity has already been created when you have like uh, ordered even a, a box of Legos and the instructions are already in there and you stick and conform to the way that it's supposed to be done with the materials that you were given. Right? And then we've canalized that. It doesn't mean there's not some creativity going on there, especially if it's your first time ever assembling something like that, or you're a brand new engineer putting together your first power plant or VW or whatever, right? Uh, so these things are um, still creative, but uh, you know, so the, but maybe the quality that we're going to judge creativity by would be more creative if. The brick allure has general knowledge of what to do, but never did this thing before and has to deal with it now in the same way that we would deal with it. Uh, if you knew about phenomenology but and tried to apply it, you might find that you needed to do some more research and study on Husserl and Heidegger and Sartre so that you could be, you know, equipped, right, to actually engage with the material, right? So. Um, but as a, as a general knowledge brick allure, you might just go ahead and do it and then let your community, you know, hammer your work and say, here, you need to fix this, right? So that would be, um, I guess, my answer to the first part of the question. Does that, is that helpful? Yes, I, it does. Okay. Uh, okay. So Shelley has a question. So just by way of kind of meeting you where you're at, are you using normativity as a frame that you want to challenge through a brick of lore that appears to be specialized and already equipped with beyond ready at hand stuff to challenge normativity. And let me just broaden out a little bit. Normativity is this thing that's like everyone wants to change it and even the most talented people have difficulty doing so. And so how does a, a regular person, and, and I, I love the thoroughness of your exploration. I can tell you've done like a lot of really cool work and I can see that this is a work in progress, like you said. I recommend maybe earlier on bringing in 
the, the personal experience of becoming one, right? Of observing one. And then kind of working out from there about what is normativity to you when you're desperate, right? Because <coughs> normativity for me is a force of, of the, that constructs tri privilege and oppression. Mm -hmm. So some bricolores are more, have more at hand and have more, and, and I felt like towards the end it almost turned into like a specialized training, you know? I just, I've, so my question is, um, is normativity your frame for establishing a brick of orcs and I'm troubled by the, by the limitations therein? And if it is, and if it's not, what is it? And how's that going? Okay, so... Sorry, uh, sorry for that. No, well, oh, no, that's fine. Perfect, perfectly good question. And... Uh, I would say, kind of flip it around, like the bricolore and, and others, right? Construct, we create normativity in what our day. everybody else? Well, okay, everybody else is, uh, is, is creating the normativity, and we're all playing the role of bricolore, making use of what we have at, at hand, whatever that is. We don't have to have a specialized skill because we're going to do it anyway. Including oppressors. Including oppressors, they're being created right. too. Yeah, yeah. That, well, there's Creative a oppression. yeah, there's a there's a like for example, there's a there's a normative framework that we Say, at least what's the, what's the use of normativity as a place for the brittle lore to sprout from, and and if it is a great place, give us the most mundane example of it, right? Like which you which you offered at the end, and I loved it. Yeah, you know. But I'm just saying, why is normativity a, pr a productivity venue for like a, a brick or a gladiator? You know. <laughs> well, okay. So um, what the? <laughs> you know, I'm not saying, yeah, I'm first, to, first off, the brick the brick allure through their creative acts winds up creating things that that may or may not. Who can and cannot be a brick allure? Anyone could be a brick allure. Everyone, <laughs> everyone, everyone, everyone is what a brick allure. Prevents people. Okay. Every, in, in some way, everyone is a brick allure. Every, because no one is completely skilled at it doing everything. It's normative and unuseful. Right. Well, okay, so the normative part, right? Like, <laughs> yes, okay, so if everyone's a brick allure, it's not exactly the same brick allure. We're all unique. We all have brick allure skill, right? We all have the ability to do something without having access or experience in a, in a deep way like an engineer. Normativity, right? This would be normativity wine glass. Like it's constructed out of the blue glass, it's got its own thing. Okay, they, be, they can make millions of them. So what the brick allure is going to do is either see, you know, hey, there's some kind of flaw in this wine glass which makes it suck, right? And I'm gonna figure out how to fix it. And the first iterations of this may not work any better than the wine glass worked in the first place. But as we know, you know, now we have like stemless wine glasses and those things can maybe just be a little thicker so they weren't so easy to break. So right? easy to break, yeah. Right. So the, uh, um, the, the point is, is that our bricolage reforms normativity. So, for example, like the oppressor version, right, heterosexual white men are this normative kind of power structure that exists at least in the West, right? And 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 so as what is the, as what is the call to bricolores to do good in the world? Well, the, why should the, they? Well, I mean, if you're in the that, that's what I that's what I mentioned before. If you're in the group where the norms are making you thrive, there's not very much interest for you to want to change it. It's people who are not in that group. Their job is to try to show through their own brick a lot. That's right? the stuff I'm talking about. Right, right. right. So, they, so you want to show like why those of us in power ought to work with you as an ally to change the paradigm that makes it better for everyone. Change the ant. Yes, change, change the norm. Change the yeah. cybernetic Sh ant. Yeah, reframe normativity, right? And so we have a new normal that we'll create, right? Oh, it's supreme enough. I don't know. I don't really have a question. I'm just having comments on the conversation. Oh, okay. And for bricolage and bricolers, um, that could orient towards a norm, or it could orient away from a norm. It's just mm -hmm. that the method is a little different right. than whatever the conventional way to get to the norm mm. or maybe some other ways to 
No, it's not the same. Deviate. It's not right. the typical way of doing it, right? Yeah. So I don't but, know that it necessarily has to go to normally. I agree. You're trying to yeah. Make it actually that's the creativity part, right? Yeah, yeah, no, it, it yeah it doesn't necessarily go to the norm, right? It, yeah. it could be that you your bricolage is not helpful, right? And you actually and and maybe you would say like this is how maybe things that become normative that aren't mm -hmm. helpful, right? Those are things that definitely are going, hopefully will fail and we'll see the light to change it to make it not that way anymore, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, this might be something just as simple as um, it used to be a norm to order stuff off of the TV ads, right? When you, before the age of the internet, and you had uh, Ginsu knives that could cut a tin can and, and, I mean, and, and then it cut a tomato, right? And, and <laughs> what's that? Well, I was, uh, there, were all these, there, were, there were all these companies that were solving problems you never had. Exactly. The pocket fisherman. Mm -hmm. I mean, who yeah. really needs one? Billy Bass yeah. or but whatever. The singing fish. Either orienting to a cultural norm or explicitly maybe going against it sometimes. Right. Well, I, I was. Know, with his comment about artifacts, um, was it, yeah. that yeah. is another whole big ball of wax. Um, or, you know, figure area for a discussion. It's like the artifact may sit there, whatever it is, if it's a coaster or a chair or whatever that you happen across. It's the interpretation of what that artifact is, does, means in its yeah. context that it is wide open for what one makes of it. Right. And that does have to do with Again, going back to, you know, kind of people's normative concepts of how like I need a battery, I can't find one. should be. Yeah. Or it's the revisionism. And so it's like, you know, with any archaeological site, you are seeing revisionism with any museum with artifacts in it. You're always gonna eventually get some revisionism depending on the extant politics or how people want to perceive their world. And mm -hmm. so your Germany, for instance, has done that revisionism many, many times over, and so yeah, does it, it, yeah. so mm -hmm. does it many other places. Yeah, US. Yeah, I think we're in the same same pot in different ways yeah. with our own revisionism. Right. How does the brick break? <laughs> what, 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 what relationship does it have with normativity? And like, does just this individual brick or decide that they don't like this for other people like it just seems like there's a, a tension here between if you're if you're throwing normativity out there and then you're mm -hmm. single you're singularizing brick or as like this agent that well is yeah. this a batman is this a superman why would they care and also like it, you know i just i feel like that this just needs like like florida that needs a brick or Right. Governor, right now. Well, and maybe right? like Ukraine yeah. is well, just screaming to me about brick or war, Moscow. You know, unfortunately, two, two great, two great. Florida has a brick or war governor. Yeah, two. He's just not. He's just not doing what I he want. Yeah. To do. Yeah. Anyway, I want to. I mean, in his the theory, thing. Florida has a brick or war governor. He's right? using yeah. maps to destroy maps. I know, but, being but so that's, socially. But I don't think that Lex can war. stop him. Well, no, the, with his theory. Anyway. And, and, well, no, and even saying, even is it, is it an individual or is it a collective thing in relation to normativity? Can, and then, folks, I appreciate you all. I will retire my questions. It can be it can be both for one for one for just kind of work back from that. Like it could be both. Obviously, you know, we exist in relation. Like that's the main kind of nuance to actor network theory is not only we actions but we're. We're relational, so we have a relation with these things. I have a relation. People. I'm getting there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and my normativity is people, like that 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 MacBook and that. Well, no, but has done a, f a fair job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But me in. but I'm what, about people. Well, even even in this relationship, so when I have a crisis or an immediate immediate need, uh, for example, our discussion about the the bubble gum and the. In the hole in the boat. That's my example from like fourth grade. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. but okay. So yeah, there's a, a boat broke down in the middle of the ocean. The person was like, "Give me this gum from my yeah. little sister." And like dove into the water, put the thing on there, right. and then this oncoming tidal wave. You know what I mean? I'm here today. 
Right. Yeah. Wait, so, just, so, just quick catch on. So, any, okay, so now <laughs> the, the, uh, the end, right? or else dead. I mean, imagine yeah. like uh, 1980s, um, the ability for someone in 1980 to successfully, you know, go out and do a gay pride march or any kind of activism on the part of people of different sexual orientations at all would be met by stiff resistance depending on the place. If you're in San Francisco, it would probably have been more normative. And if you were in San Jose, I don't know, right? If you were in, in Carbondale or have in Marion. Have you helped your friends fix things that they couldn't afford to fix before? Absolutely. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, That's uh, what I'm talking about. Yeah, uh, and the, the the example that uh, you know, there's a, there's a couple examples, right? You could you could talk about you know helping. Like I have no idea about relationships. I'm pretty bad at them sometimes, <laughs> and uh, and 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 yet you know I I do know couples you know yeah, through my yeah. life where I've been able to just like listen and be you know offer whatever kind of minimalist advice that I could to help them kind of see their way through a problem and have it work. And thankfully, I've never had it not work in that occasion because I would feel really bad. But I was doing a little bricolage, right? And, uh, and, and it just happened to be good um, going to uh, help a friend broke down with a car. And I had a, a carton, like a cardboard carton from a Mountain Dew container. They needed a gasket for their thermostat. I brick a lord that, you know, and, and, and put some, some yeah, some, some, uh, um, you know, little sealant on there and, and, save some life, and it save worked some for the time being. Bucks. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, it worked and, and then they didn't have to get a tow, they didn't have to call a mechanic, you know what I mean? And then we could later go to the parts store and get the actual real gasket that was, you know, made for the car and switch it out, but it got the, the overheated car to not be overheated and get back to where it needed to go. And so this is kind of the thing that bricolage or bricolore is going to do and it's going to help us figure out how do we get our collective car, say in, a, in an instance of global climate change or something like that, how do we get our collective car to not have the, the big break it down, to not have the massive, you know, blow up, right? And, and take things, you know, and use the tools that we have to fix the problems that are, we're faced with. So More people should be bricolores. I think more people. Everybody is. Everybody, everybody, everybody is in well, a way. So, what's the difference between bricolage and improvisation? Well, bricolage, uh, improvisation, and bricolage, I think, um, might be very similar. If, if anything else, improvisation doesn't usually. I mean, when I think of improvisation, maybe I haven't thought about it well enough. So, give me that. But I think of it as something like right now i'm doing improvisation i'm i'm answering your questions right but it doesn't necessarily require any kind of action with the material world or with anything other than me just taking so what i'm going to improvise on the base that doesn't require interaction with the there you go. Well, so then the improvisation and bricolage or brick, being a bricolore are very similar. Uh, bricolore is the metaphor, obviously, that applies to something. There's a skill. Where, yeah. That, that, there's a that, skill there. Whether yeah, exactly. it's there honestly or ready at yeah. end, there's something that's earned. Yeah, and obviously, and if, yeah, if you're... It's if, a MacGyver situation. Exactly. MacGyver. MacGyver. It's a MacGyver. Exactly. Right? They're yep. like the, it's, the thing is sinking. They're like, give me that gun. You don't Bye. want to be a yeah. MacGyver a bass solo. Right, no, no, we don't. I've seen it done. Though. Yeah, well, maybe if I grab the, if I grab the violin bow and I start. Well, and and, and that might go to what Sabrina said a little bit earlier about how bricolage doesn't always go the way you, you want. Yeah, right, you fail at bricolage. Right, you yeah. can do it. You can have bricolage take you in the wrong way. For example, I'm not a good bass. I'm saying if you improvise on the bass and it doesn't go well, and you and maybe you think it does, right? The intersubjective. So then you'll. Really jamming now, and everybody's leaving the room. Yeah, you'll take that stuff on the road and clear out the bars, right? Like, they'll, you yeah, know, so. I have seen a version of like dueling banjos in the midnight stage of Rockfest uh -huh. and where work all the instruments were playing yeah. very yeah. unconventional. Oh, like yes. instruments playing instruments? I think. Uh, just like, I don't know. You would just bring out a drink of oboe or uh, just other oboe for dueling banjos. Okay. Things showing up. I love an oboe. I think Panyo has a question. Thank you. Yeah. Sweet. Um, 
Wow, thank you, Les. That was very informing and interesting and fine and um, thought stimulating. I was thinking a number of things when you were talking. When, I really love your metaphor of the bricolure, bricolage. Thank you. It made me think of a lot of things like MacGyver situation and a lot of kind of unconventional kind of uh, surprising situations that challenge your abilities mm -hmm. to adapt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, um, you know, and, and I was, I think you, you gave us already the answer, but I'd I like you to flesh it out a little bit more. Um, because I, I think you gave us the answer with your, with your interpretation of creativity. You gave us the answer to this question, but um, I did feel like, for example, some of the apories of 20th century philosophy were um, made around, uh, for example, Wittgenstein's problem of following a rule. Mm. You know, remember that, that if, 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 you know, if you follow a rule, are you really following the rule, or, or is it the rule that is being made, mm. or what's going on? And, 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 and it, that seems to be a very kind of, a, as it were... Um, is it free? Are you freely choosing? Yeah, like a, like a very hard kind of theory on normativity. Whereas, what we form here with the creativity element, it seems to be like normativity is a habit of action mm -hmm. that is being um, crystallized as it goes. I use the word. I use the word canalized. Yeah. Canalized. I like yeah. that. But Almost like Berkson like, used it, like digging Berkson, a canal. Dewey uses it. Yeah, Dewey uses uh, it well. Yeah. You used it earlier. Yes. Yes. I, I'm thinking in Persian terms, but. Well, pragmatic, pragmatic yeah. daily routine. Kind of, a, you kind of a give, um, you strengthen the pattern of your problem solving, for example, in Dewey. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and of course, you know, I, we know that every one of us could be MacGyver, but, but not every one of us actually is MacGyver. Mm -hmm. right. and what's the reason for that? Well, I think is this. Uh, there's an ongoing habit and conscious self-control activity mm. in order to make that non-activity a part of, like a virtue, right? right. Like, a, like mm. a strengthened habit mm -hmm. that becomes uh, more and more strong, but it doesn't take away the, the freedom from you. Right. And I really like that uh, from what you said. It seemed like the creativity is actually the element that gives us um, the freedom that we need to not make non-activity something coercive coercive or kind of uh, constraining right like in right. this kind Need of nihilism yes it's kind like of there's a, a bricolor nihilism right. the well, distinguishing eye right i didn't yeah. mean to step to no 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 I you're right you're, you're okay right uh, so all Sorry. in all the question is what would you say to us if, in order to avoid this kind of a uh, hard uh, hard uh, interpretation normativity that actually takes away the freedom from us Mm. Well, okay. So um, I'd say good luck. On, <laughs> I mean, it, because as I say, in, as I say in my paper, these things vary by culture and epoch. And I, and I mentioned Ukraine, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we have a situation where the West, you know, and uh, what, where are your, what is the specific question you're responding to? Will you just summarize it and then respond, just so I can. Okay, so he's asking me about how to avoid this kind of hardened normativity that creates yes. a problem, basically. The, the paradox of following a rule um, right. in early Wittgenstein. Yeah. Right, right. So um, the, uh, <laughs> the problem that we have, right, is that different cultures, for example, you know, uh, the British empiricists have one way of looking at things, right? Vladimir Putin has another way of looking at things, the Western you know, kind of free ride, you know, having a good time person has a different way of looking at things in the Western efficiency, right? Like money, right? Like they have a different way. And so when you get norm when normativity comes into play with a dominant paradigm, right? Being in control and establishing a rule that everyone must follow. For example, we're all in the same calendar. Everyone in America uses a dollar, right? We have normative rules in place that at least in theory are meant to be for the betterment of the society to keep us all on the same mm -hmm. page. It's when those kind of normative frameworks wind up to be oppressive to certain groups, right, that, 
you know, whether they're minorities or not, right? That's when they become a problem. So this idea of like rules is something that you have to run into a crisis. And so the, the, if you're in the dominant paradigm, you don't run into a crisis with um, any of these things, right? Like if you're in control, right? It's when you're one of the people who's been marginalized, who's been oppressed, who's been hurt by whatever the normative paradigm is, that's when you need to, to become the brick allure to find out how to use what you have to fix the problem that you've got. So you have a problem with an oppressive structure or a set of rules and standards which unfairly bias you as someone who will be disenfranchised or hurt in some way by this normativity, by this, by this apparatus that has been created by the people who are enjoying right, the fruits of it. So the way that we break that right is through this creativity through this bricolage because you wouldn't want to change it unless you either saw the suffering of the other who was being crushed by your normative framework right you've created utopia why do you want to change it and then you say oh because it really hurts these people right i should make some kind of at least an exception so that it doesn't do that mm -hmm. but you may not see that so the person who is oppressed is more likely because they're faced with a crisis, as I say in the paper, like crisis is a big part of the need, the imperative to do bricolage, to become a bricolore, right? So you're not going to want, why would you want to fix it if it ain't broken, right? You wouldn't. It's when it's broken that you say, this needs fixed, so. A little like teeny it. question from Shelby. Little tiny one. This is the last one. Little tiny one. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. Also, like I can tell that this is your work in progress. Like you, you have done a, a, a dearth. You know, of that means a lot, right? Does dearth mean a lot? I think so. Okay. What are, it means a lot. Just yeah, say a lot. A lot. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, <laughs> so that better, better mean a lot. It's the opposite right. of a paucity. Right. All right. You've done like. Of not in paucity um, of research. <laughs> it's, clear, it's clearly coming together. I love these questions about object relationship, about relationship to normativity. One of the things I guess I just wanted to share and, and that you've made me think is that perhaps it, other than thinking about normativity, which is like stuff that bodies are kind of performing either with or against their will, it's a, it's a problematic concept. It doesn't really offer that much to work with, it's right. too general, right. it's too normative. Right. And also who gets to say what's normative and then you don't even wanna go into that. Right. So rather, if you think about collectivity and if you think about community partnerships and if you look into some, um, like in St. Louis, for example, I know there's this activist uh, that drives this, like pulls this trailer into you know the hood you know, the, 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 our marginalized, underserved, absolutely trapped parts of town with art supplies, you know? And like, and then these kids all come out of their houses, they're never out there and they do art together, you know? And it's awesome. Like, that's, that's a literal, normative, challenging brick, brick collage. Right, brick war? Brick yeah. Liz. I mean, she's, she needs to be brick Liz. <laughs> I mean, just, mm -hmm. I'm already, yeah. But like, but what about some of these concrete ground level stuff? Because I know that you, like, you're a builder and stuff. And I thank you so much. You did a great job. That just one of just, and also answer that, you know, slash high five. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. yeah. So uh, thank you. Another great question. And um, so um, I think that the uh, the the bricolore bricolose, right? has to confront the problems when they face them, right? There are, there are, there is an imperative, right? When you, um, I, casual. yeah, no, I, I lived on Venice Beach, you know, before I moved to Carbondale and, um, and there were homeless veterans in mass, you know, homeless people in general. And, you know, I had no good way to help them all. Mm -hmm. I would go Tuesdays and buy like a hundred tacos, take them to the beach, distribute them. Um, and then, uh, there were particular individuals who I singled out and says, what I'd say, what do you need to help you to like get off the do street? Do what you can when you right. can in that moment. Exactly. With the with tools that you have. Exactly. Yeah. So, 
So, and I never thought of myself as doing that bricolore at the time. It's only in reflection that I recognize it. Instead of normal. Right, right, right. Disembodied, cruel Florida Ron DeSantis bullshit. Right. Well, and those may be, they're, they're, these may be, you know, obviously I think you're right that I do need like a specific artifact, something boots on the ground, eye level, um, yeah, pottery piece or, or, or something of that nature to really drill down on even with the or more... a couple of different yeah, 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 examples. Yeah, exactly. That's how it builds up. Exactly. I love it. So, I love anyway. it. Can I start the boss? Mm -hmm. I love it.